the lineups for the Cubs. Dernier in center. Sandberg at second. Matthews in left. Moreland in right. Say at third. Davis the catcher. Durham at first. Boa the shortstop. Sutcliffe 15-1 and one, the pitcher. For the Pirates. Joe Ursulak in left field. Lee Lacey in left field. Ursulak is playing center. Johnny Ray at second base. Thompson at first. Pena the catcher. Morrison at third. Froebel in right. Wotus the shortstop. Larry McWilliams the pitcher. Lee Wire the plate umpire. Dutch Renard at first. Eddie Montague at second. Eric Gregg at third. First pitch of the ball game swung. Gribbler Wotus up throwing in time. On the first pitch, Bobby Dernier rolls out to Ron Wotus playing shortstop. Now, Arnie Harris, our producer director, is in the truck. He has telephonic contact with Bill Webb, who's his counterpart on the Mets television. So we are going to keep you up to date on the Mets game with the Phillies at the same time as you watch the Cubs playing the Pirates. Here's Ryan Sandberg. There's a first pitch. He drills in left field. He go, he'll go for two, and there he goes on his way to second. Where the double? Boy, oh boy, had Lacey not cut that ball off, Sandberg would have had that 20th triple. Lacey on the dead run cuts it off, keeps it from going to the wall. The outfield is wet in Pittsburgh, and this ball could have easily skipped to the wall, but Lee Lacey, who's had a great last month, hustles into the corner and keeps Sandberg at second. The Pirates have won six games in a row, three with Dale Barrett shortstop and three with Ron Wotus. Dale Barra had that infected elbow. Now they found there's a bone chip in the elbow. So whether he plays or not the rest of this year is questionable. Here's Gary Matthews, a man in scoring position, one out. You know, Sandberg needs only eight hits, which you'll get. A, a triple and a homer, which would be much more difficult for him to get because it's hard to get triple. He, needs, he would become the only player in baseball history to have ever had 200 hits, 20 or more doubles, 20 or more triples, 20 or more homers, and 20 or more stolen bases. The pit. A high pop foul back to count even. A ball and a strike. Juan Samuel just started the ball game for the Phillies with a home run. They're out in front, one to nothing. Here's the pitch in the side. Swung and missed. A slow curve. We all feel that the Phillies are going to beat the Mets tonight. They have John Denny going for them. The Phillies do. But the Cubs want to win it with a victory. Here's a pitch. Oh! with both game-winning hits and a doubleheader yesterday puts the Cubs on top. Jim Fry before the game said that over the last two months, the most valuable player on this ball club is undoubtedly Gary Matthews. He has been the spark plug for the Cubs, and there you can see the bench. They are a purposeful crew tonight. Here now is Keith Morland. Arnie's going to show you this crowd, and then I'm going to read you some notes. And then you can decide for yourself how big a percentage of this crowd are Chicago fans. They're from Racine, Wisconsin, the Exners, and Alfreda Petsky. They're here from Illinois State University, drove up last night. Lee Finter, Brent Moore, Carl Peters, Tim McCann, and Rob Chavin. There's a strike called over the outside corner. They're here. The singing waiters of Glenview are here. They drove all the way in to see the ball game. And they sign that message, the singing waiters of Glenview, as a cue for who they are. A ball and a strike. I don't know who they are myself, but I guess when I said the singing waiters of Glenview, whomever they want to know or 
but they're here. We'll know. Throw over to first, the runner back. Mike Murphy here from Chicago. Joe Jablowski, John Mays, and Keith Kowalski are here from Northern Illinois University. Outside the Moreland. Laura Reindak, a friend of Yosh Kawana, is here from Chicago. Mets are batting in the bottom of the first. Phillies lead one to nothing. Here's Moreland taking it low. Ball three. Three balls and a strike. There's our seventh camera in use tonight, directly behind home plate at a lower level. Strike call over the outside corner. Bob and Sean Gorman from Largo, Florida. This is a good time to send the base runner, try to stay out of the double play. There goes the runner, a high pop fly, short left center, who's going to get it? And Orsalak makes the catch. Joe Orsalak, the center fielder, a rookie. Orsalak has a much better arm than Maravell Wynn, and he's got great speed. Here he takes over for Lee Lacey. Trips after making a fine catch, but Matthews, who was running, has to hustle back to first base. Eleven students are here from the University of Illinois. Willie Jason, Willie Jason, Brad, Sean, Ed, Brian, Yale, Doug, and Bill Roundtree. They drove 500 miles to see the Cubbies clinch the division title, their notes said. They should have come in with the singing waiters. They wouldn't need a radio. <laughs> Here's a curve a little bit high. Boy, we just, I'm gonna read all these notes just to give you an idea. And Arnie's gonna show you everybody who's in the stand. You can certainly do that with the Pittsburgh fans. <laughs> They're on the first base side. Here's a curve and a strike call. There'd be nobody here if it wasn't for these fans who came in to see the Cubs. Here's Ernie Engelhart, who used to live in Lyle, drove in from Columbus to see the Cubs clinch. As a ground ball up the middle of base hit. Here's Matthews pulling up at second base. Save. Singles to center. Here's Jody Davis hitting two. 59, 19 homers. Williams is one and two this year against the Cubs. He beat Stoddard in that 11 to six game at Wrigley Field. Sutcliffe started that game. It looked for a while like he was going to have his 13 game winning streak snap, but he got off the hook. Now the stretch the pitch. Low curveball inside ball one. You know the Cubs have six players, Steve, with 80 or more RBIs. Say's got 96, Durham 95, Jody 91, Sandberg and has 81, the Sarge has 82, and Mor Moreland has 80. That's, that's a lot of production up and down your batting order. Probably the most remarkable out of all those RBIs is the fact that Moreland has gotten his RBI total to 80 because he didn't play a whole lot the first couple months of the season. He's had a very productive year since taking over from Mel Hall. And Sandberg because he's batting second. He can only be one man on base the first time he comes to bat. Two balls and a strike to count. They're here from East Chicago, Indiana, home of Tim Stoddard. Shirley and Christina Navarro and Joe, Linda, and Jolie DeLeon. Two balls and a strike. Pulled a foul outside third. Five guys from Illinois State University are here. Johan, Jimmy, and Tony and somebody else. Here's Jim. It's Jim Wynn warming Jim up Wynn. already. We saw him in Chicago. He throws the ball pretty well. He threw four innings of relief against the Cubs in Wrigley. Here's a pitch. Strike him out with a fastball. Jody Davis caught out on strikes. Didn't like it. One run out of all that. Three hits. No errors. Two left. We go to the bottom of the first. The Cubs are leading one to nothing.
Gary Carey back at Three Rivers Stadium. You're getting a good look at the Red Baron. Rick Sutcliffe from Kansas City going for his 16th victory as a Cub. He's lost only one, shooting for his 14th in a row. He's got an unusual motion. As you look at his wrist, he calls, he does what he calls wrist wrapping. There you can see it in back of him now, and there was a school of thought that said that you've got a lot of arm problems if you throw that way. A lot of people thought Sutcliffe would never be very successful in the major leagues because of that unorthodox delivery, but he could set a whole new trend if he has about five years more of success like this year. Thank you see Chuck Tanner, the great manager of the Pirates. Jay Eck, who's the system basketball coach at uh, Pittsburgh, with his son Jason. They're both from Peoria originally. Jack, you know, speaking of starting a trend, didn't Larson start a trend? That no wind-up trend with that no-hitter in the series? After that, nobody took the wind-up anymore. There's a pitch high to George Salak. Charlie and Joanne Belfield from Peoria also here. Orsalak had a cut of the mess. Hey, there's Yosh Kawana. We have a camera in the clubhouse waiting for the happy moment when the Cubs have clinched the division title. Now we can finally find out what Yosh does. I like that shot, Arnie. The pitch on the way. Bouncing ball. say has got it. Good throw, get him, one out. Orsalak is a very good defensive player, and the only question on the part of the Pirates is, can he hit Major League pitching? Thus far, he has not been able to. Listen to this note. We flew here after work, and our wives are probably wondering where we are. Please inform them we're in Pittsburgh to watch the Cubs clinch the pennant. Rob Rook, M-R-U-K, and John Woodruff, Lombard, Illinois. All right, gals, you can go out on the town now. They're here in Pittsburgh. Here's Lee Lacey. Strike call. The Mets have the bases loaded with nobody out in the first inning. With the Pirates leading, or rather with the Phillies leading one to nothing. How back. All of you Chicago fans who concerned about Marvell Wynn. He's out of the lineup with a leg problem. He experienced it three games ago. That was the first game that he missed all year long. So Marvell, usually very durable, now is on a day-to-day -day basis. They're not too certain. They just don't want to take a chance with injuring him further. Mary and Larry from Cicero are here pulling for the cup. There's a strike three call. Lacey called out on strike. Harry, we're dealing with an umpire here who has a pretty big strike zone in Lee Wire, so it should be a good night for Sutcliffe. He works the corners, and this is the best umpire in the league for Rick to throw to. So you should see probably 10 or 12 strikeouts tonight from the big right-hander. Well, the Mets are not going to uh, take a line down. Strawberry just tripled with the bases loaded. The Mets lead 3-1. to one. If the Cubs are going to clinch it tonight, they got to win. Oh, and won the count. Johnny Ray fouls it off. Bob Murphy from the south side of Chicago. That'll give me an idea. All these fans all have banners, notes. They're all from Chicago or environs. Pitch of Johnny Ray. A little bit low and inside. S Scott Trailer from Overland Park, Kansas. Rick Sutcliffe comes from that area, as does Bobby Dernier. Here's the pitch. Bouncing ball. Sandberg's got it. One, two, three in the first. Nothing across. At the end of one inning, the Cubs are out in front. One to nothing. Brickhouse and Steve Stone, Harry Carey back at Three Rivers Stadium as we go down to the top of the second. 
the Cubs are leading one to nothing. Here's Leon Durham against Larry McWilliam. First pitch. Her ball a little bit high. David Johnson and Chris Marg Morrison are here from Chicago. Now, time is called. Jim Harris from Manuka, Illinois, and Ken Gerling from Bradley, along with Michael Harris for you. Two balls, no strike. Bradley, that's for Jack Brickhouse is on the board of directors, aren't you? A trustee or something? Yes, and Harry, we're making you an honorary trustee with the understanding that you're going to give us a, a, a little uh, Harry Carey Foundation starting out with about five mil. <laughs> I know you didn't get there by giving any money. <laughs> if I had yours, I would. <laughs> two balls, two strikes. Hey, you're the only guy I know who cries with two loaves of bread under each arm. <laughs> Two balls, two strikes, time is called. As soon as I get five mil put together, though, I'm, I'm going to go for that, Jack. I'll call Pete Van Ock and get a loan. Here's a pitch a little high, ball three. Now that he's the owner of the Peoria Chiefs, who will be associated with the Cubs next year, 3-2 pitch. A high pop foul out of play. Hey, Arnie, just pan the crowd so they'll get an idea from these many notes I'm reading. What a big percentage of this crowd is from Chicago. Scott Paul's from Na Naperville is here. Remember what I told you yesterday, Harry, that even though they don't have a 50,000 St. Louis crowd in Pittsburgh tonight, the Cub fans will make it sound like it. Yeah. Here's a high pop foul. The shortstop orders. He didn't look too good on that. They may not give him an error, but they should. He should have caught it. He didn't get to the ball in time. It looked like Jim Morrison was going to take over. Now Wotus comes over. He calls for it, but the ball drifts on him a little bit, hits off the end of his glove. That's a ball that he should have had. And Leon Durham gets another life. They haven't indicated an error yet. What a lot of people don't realize is that that field slopes to the left as you go out there. And uh, I remember it costing Greg Gross very much an opener here one time. Here's a pitch swung on, fly ball, short center field. It'll be caught. They have given Wilderson air for dropping the foul ball. And now Durham flies out, given a second chance to bat. Steve Chervinko from Berwyn is here. McWilliams is working a little more slowly tonight than we've seen him in the past, but you still have to be ready in the batter's box. There's Larry Boa taking the strike. Bill Perry from Schaumburg. Andy Butler from Chicago. And Matt Simons from Chicago here. A ball and a strike to count. Larry Boa hitting 220. Batting only 132 against Pittsburgh pitching. Slider in there, beauty. Strike call. Tipped it. One and two the count. At, at the end of one inning, the Mets four, the Phillies won. Frank Amori from Chicago here to watch the Cubs. Here's the pitch a little bit inside. And Gary Stapina and Dick Krasinski from LaGrange came over to see the Cubs clinch. There's a bouncing ball, Morrison, long throw, wild throw, bounces into the stands, and Boa will go to second base. They may give him a hit, plus the air. I got to believe it is a hit in the air. That's a tough play for Morrison, but he threw the ball over the head of six-foot-four-inch Jason Thompson. Boa getting out of the box, stumbling, still probably would beat the throw. Watch how high Thompson goes up and still can't come down with the ball. Would have been a bang-bang play, and as yet, they have not made a ruling. It's a base hit. It's got to be an error because he moved to second base. That's right. And an error. There's two errors in this inning. 
Here's Sutcliffe, a good hitting pitcher. He's batting 245, no homers and five RBI. Has more hits than any other pitcher on the staff. 13. One ball, no strikes. Sutcliffe against the left-hander. Mets are leading the Phillies four to one at the end of one. There is a strike call. I got a letter for you, Harry. A gentleman writes me. His name is George Sacalaris. He said the best thing about his name is when you spell it backwards, it's Cyrillicus and still sounds Greek. <laughs> I never could understand why all Greek names end in S. There must be some reason for it. And I know a lot of wonderful Greek people, and nobody ever gives me a satisfactory answer. How about Nick Nicholas? He could probably explain that to you. Hey, all Nick can explain to you is the bottom line, which is always a hefty one, like all your restaurant tours <laughs> do. Here's a pitch swamp. Smash on the ground. In the center, a base hit. Here comes Boa. Two to nothing, Cub. Sutcliffe drives in his sixth run of the year. Sutcliffe got a base hit against McWilliams in Wrigley Field. So he must see the ball well. That's unusual. McWilliams is usually very tough on left-handers. This ball just grazes the glove of Johnny Ray, and Larry Boa scores. So the defense has opened the door for the Cubs this inning. The Pirates have had defensive deficiencies all year long. Well, I hope Sutcliffe has a real good game tonight. He always does, with rare exceptions. The reason I say that is because of all the media attention on this game of the Cubs, being able to clinch it with a victory, it would just about guarantee him the Cy Young Award with a good performance here tonight. Here's Bobby Dernier, first pitch inside. Lee Tunnel was up and loosening up in the Pirate bullpen. Well, he'd be on the cover of all the magazines in the country if he wins this one, Harry. Here's a ground ball to Shard. Out at second. And out at third. Double play, Dernier, 6-4-3. One run, though, with two hits, two errors, and nobody left. We're going to the bottom of the second. Two to nothing in favor of the Cup. Harry Carey back at Three Rivers Stadium. We're going to show you a play at first base. See if you don't think Dernier is safe here. Well, pretty close either way. We have the Penguin at third base, the Boa at short, Rhino at second, and Bull at third. The gang from Schweda's in Lake Zurich, Illinois, point that out. You're watching Chicago Cubs Championship Baseball over WGN Chicago Channel 9. America's number one sports station where every evening at 9 you see the news and at 10.30 every night through the World Series, the Cubs final. Here's Jason Thompson leading it off. Matt and Joy down in Key West, Florida. There's a ground ball. Go up. Throwing. Four to Tired by Sutcliffe. That'll bring up Tony Pena. It's been remarkable that Pittsburgh has suddenly found their offense during the six-game winning streak, which matches their longest of the year. And with Bill Madlock out of the lineup, this club has suddenly started to come alive offensively. They've had fine pitching all year, but they've got to trade some of those pitchers to get another quality power hitter on the club for next season. The Andersons from Tampa. They're here from... Fruit Heights, Utah. And from Kendallville, Indiana. All rooting for the cup. Pena takes a curve outside. One ball, no strikes. They're from Erie, Pennsylvania, the Rowell family. Hey, he throws the bat on, and almost lands in the cup dugout. Fortunately, it didn't go into the crowd or the dugout. It hit the facing of the Rob dugout. Hassey almost got cream. And all the water and ice spills all over the place. Hassey might have to go back on the DL. 
Dick Rudman with the chart. That got messed up also. The Real family. Helen, Tony, Deb, Diane, Gina, J.H., and Jane. Oh, all here pulling with the Cubs. Look at Ron Halsey. It's a good thing he's not chewing tobacco. That could have ruined his whole night. Anything but smoking a cigar. That would ruin everybody's whole night. A ball and a strike. One out. Two to nothing in favor of the Cubs. The Mets are also winning. Four to one. I don't know, Harry. You better get that big cigar ready. This looks like it could be the night. Sutcliffe is awfully tough, and the Cubs are on top early. A ball and a strike. The Herman family from Kent, Ohio is here. There's been a little mix-up in the umpires that they handed us uh, in the press section. Uh, turn it around, Harry. You've got Montague umpiring at first and Dutch Renner at second. Yeah, I recognize Dutch out there. But Lee Wire is working the plate. Here's the pitch. Low outside. And Eric Gregg, ponderous form of a man, weighing about 300, working at third base. One out, Tony Pena, the hitter. There's a high top fly. Durham is there. He's got it. Some fan yells out, Harry, this bud's for you. The no, the bud will be for me. If they clinch it tonight, the cigar will be for you. Well, I mean, you don't mind if I chase it down with a <laughs> cold Budweiser, do you? No, you can chase it down with anything. Two men are out. Jim Morrison. There you see the Red Baron firing. Curveball a little bit low and outside. Morrison hitting 275 with eight homers. Barring a catastrophe, this is going to be Rick Sutcliffe's last start before the playoffs. They don't have him penciled in at all. They'd like him to get some rest. They feel he's just a little arm weary at this point of the season. There's the pitch a little bit low. Philly's got one the second inning. Four to two now in favor of the Mets. Now the pitch to Morrison. High pop foul over near the stand and out of play. Our friendly mailman, Robert C. Hyden Jr., wires in. Ron Cullinan and his son Joey are here from Chicago. And Jan and Joe Zalecki from Des Plaines. Pirates were surprised by Sutcliffe and Wrigley Field. They said they realized he was a fastball pitcher, but he threw more breaking balls than they expected. He's thrown a lot of breaking balls again here tonight. There's a pitch swung on a high, towering fly ball. Will be caught. The Sarge is back, waiting, and he has it. Six in a row retired by Sutcliffe. And at the end of two, it remains. Comes two, Pirates nothing. With Jack Brickhouse and Steve Stone, Harry Carey back at Three Rivers Stadium. That'll give you an idea of the many Cub fans who made the trip over here from Chicago to be in on the kill. Cubs plus WGN. Mary Ben from Highland Park. Dave Waxman from Munster, Indiana. From the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Drove in from Philly to see his history made today. There's some more, the many signs. Here we go. Here's Sandberg. Third ball outside. Maureen Skipper and Ken Carbelling drove in from Chicago. Just to see the game. Here's a base hit. Down the left field line. Into the corner. Here goes Sandberg. Can he make a triple out of it? No, he stops at second base. Two doubles in a row for Reno. Harry, if he was thinking about the record, he would have tried because Lee Lacey did bobble the ball in left field. 
This really shows you where Sandberg's priorities really lie. He wants the Cubs to win. Watch what happens to Lacey as the ball goes into the corner. It comes off the wall. It's an automatic double, but now Lee botches it a little bit. Sandberg might have been able to make the turn because Lacey doesn't have that strong of an arm, but he stays at second, realizing that there's nobody out. So here now is the Sard, who drove in the first run of the ball game, and if the Cubs lead holds, he would have gained his 19th game-winning RBI. He already leads the National League in that department. There's a fastball high. Wilma Knapp and Margot Shartridge and John Shartridge are here pulling for the Cubs. Good fastball. Chris McWilliams has a good live arm. Ray Lindemann drove in from Clearwater, Florida to see the Cubs clinch. A ball and a strike. High fastball inside. They're showing this game at Chase Stadium on their big Diamond Vision board. Bill Webb, who is the counterpart on the Mets television of uh, the great Arnie Harris on ours. And he and Arnie are coordinating the reports. Here's the pitch of strike call. Well, in those 18 games against the Mets, Harry, the Mets fans saw a whole face full of Sandberg and Matthews, and they're getting it again here tonight. I don't think they're too happy in Shea Stadium right now. Three balls, two strikes. Nobody out, a runner at second base. McWilliams ready, the pitch on the way. Hey, there's his 100th walk of the year. The first Cubs since 1960 to get 100 walks in the season. Richie Ashford did it as a member of the Cubs in 1960. I think he wants the ball. He wants to put that ball in his trophy case. That's likely to be the first time that Matthews has walked 100 times. That's quite an accomplishment, especially for a man who does swing as aggressively as Gary Matthews. To have the patience to take 100 walks really helps the ball club ahead of the fourth and fifth hitters. Carl Oderness, a Cub fan, is here. Here now is Moreland. Runners at first and second. Nobody out. Time is called. Strike call. Barbara and Joe Van, Sch Van Schellen from South Holland, Illinois. Steve Prout's hometown. Here to cheer the Cubs on. There's the ball done it beautifully. The throw to first. Wow! Here's one run going to score. took advantage of the defensive deficiencies of Jim Morrison. He's filling in at third for Bill Madlock, and he's not known as a glove man. He fields it well and throws it behind both Moreland and Jason Thompson. No play at all for Thompson, and the Cubs go up three to nothing, have two runners in scoring position, and the Penguin up. The Penguin singled his first time at bat. No word yet from the official score. It looked to me like it might have been a hit in an air. Now ready. They give him a hit, all right. And an error, Morrison. That's the third error already for the Pirates. A run scored, Sandberg. Runners in second and third. The infield comes in. Three to nothing, Cup. There's a strike call. Tonight's the night. They'll be dancing in the streets everywhere. If the Cubs hold this lead, regardless of what the Mets do. Jim Wynn warming up in the bullpen for Pittsburgh. One ball, one strike. Now the pitch. There's a drive! 
precipitous curving foul. Hey, Steve, you can tell that Jack Brickhouse is not accustomed to being around winning teams. Look how he's dressed. He walks into the clubhouse dressed like that. There goes the $600 suit, the $50 shirt, the $100 tie. You know, you're right. I hadn't thought about that, Harry. <laughs> well, you only missed the cost of the coat by about, you know... You like the coat? You really like it? No, no it's too big for me. It was the $2 tie that you were missing. <laughs> Say it goes down swinging. You like the coat, Harry? I got two. The guy didn't have change for a 20. <laughs> Here's Johnny David. Runner still at second and third with the infield in. Say, closing in on the 100 RBI mark at 96. Missed a great opportunity right here. Here's Jody, fouls it off. One strike to nothing. William Sigmund from Indianapolis. This is a big at bat for the Cubs because they'll probably walk Leon Durham to get to Boa if McWilliams can get by Jody Davis. It's up to Jody to get another run home. Here's the pitch. Fastball inside. Phillies have just scored another run. They're still batting in the top of the third. The Mets lead now is cut to four to three. Just one. One ball, one strike. Infield in. And inside, ball two. Tom and Suzanne Welsh are here to pull for the Cub. They have relatives back home in Chicago. Two balls and a strike. Harry, to most of these Cub players who have been with the Cubs only a few years, this is going to be one of the finest nights of their life. But for Cub fans who have been cheering this club for 30 and 40 years, this has to be a thrilling moment. Two balls and a strike. Foul back. Got a good pitch to hit that time. Earl E. Daly is here with a group. Trailing by a run, and runners at second and third with one out up at Chase Stadium. Two balls, two strikes. Oh, he takes the fastball again. Strike three, that's two times in a row. I think each time Jody's been waiting for that slider or curveball, and McWilliams has simply fooled him. You've got to realize when you go to the plate, that you're going to have a little bit bigger plate than usual. Watch this pitch. It probably is a few inches inside. It looks to be about three or four inches inside, but Lee Weyer once again has been a good pitcher's umpire since the day he came into this league, and you've got to realize that and just go up there swinging. They're going to walk Durham intentionally now to get to Boa. Boa's a better hitter right-handed than left-handed than left-handed. So he, he could deliver here. Kevin Sepak from Sherville, Indiana is here. With his wife Lind Linda. Oh, his wife Linda's at home. Three balls, no strikes. There's the fourth pitch going intentionally outside. Boy, McWilliams, I thought he might balk there for a moment. That'd be something if you balk while giving an intentional pass. Screwy things like that have happened. Larry Bow has got that batting average up to 220. Pretty hard to do this time of year, but he has been stinging the ball lately. And I think Tony Pena is going out there to talk to him and tell him not to take this guy for granted right-handed because he does have some power. And that's really shown in where Joe Orslak is playing him in center field. And Lee Lacey a little bit deeper than he usually would play Larry in left. Here's Larry Boa with the bases loaded. A blow here. He can start drinking the champagne. Or the Budweiser. Or whatever. One ball, no strikes. Fred and Bernie Greaves. Greasy. 
with their neighbors Bill and Joyce Lothan from Lombard, Illinois, drove in today for this game. One ball, no strikes. Curveball or a slider inside. Remember, sometimes after an intentional walk, the pitcher will walk the next hitter. Why that is, I don't know. Sometimes you relax or you just get out of the habit of throwing the ball over the plate. I don't think Larry will give him a chance. He's, he'll probably jump on this pitch. Two balls, no strikes. He swung and he fouled it back. Mike Schmidt trying to score after the catch on a fly ball to Danny Heap was thrown out at the plate. So the Mets still lead four to three in the third inning at Shea Stadium. Time is called. Boa steps out of the batter's box. There's a high fly ball. Lacey back. That'll be easy. Near the warning track. Boa flies out. Only one run out of all that. Two hits, one air, three left. We go to the bottom of the third. Three to nothing. The Cubs are leading. Harry Carey back in Pittsburgh. We go into the bottom of the third. Doug Froba leading it off. Rick Sutcliffe is retired. Six men in a row. There's a strike call. Froba not too happy with that call. He's looking at the outside corner going. It's a little bit wide tonight, Lee. All in one the count. No pit. Foul to back. Joe and Mary Allegretti. And their family are here from Rolling Prairie, Indiana, to help the Cubs clinch the pennant, their notes say. Now ready? A little bit low. Look at that, covering up the lockers in the Cubs' uh, dressing room so their street clothes will not be damaged by the whatever happens. Here's a bit. Hi, pop foul. See, Yosh Kawana thinks of everything. Froble's not wearing any contacts tonight. This is the continuing saga of the contact case. He wore one in... Wrigley Field, then he didn't wear any, then he wore two. Now he says he's going to put them away for the rest of the year. Wise choice. The pit. Strike him out! Second strikeout, seventh in a row. Wayne Devely, a Chicago Cub fan, is here. Chuck Tanner was used to shifting around the lineup, and he's had to do that with Barra out of the lineup. Wotus, normally a second baseman, has had to play shortstop. Al Monchak, the infield coach, has been working with him. Here's the pitch, and it's a strike call to Ron Wotus. Hitting 209 with no homers and two RBIs. Salita Mikesell and her husband, Jim, who have an antique shop near here. Great Cub fans from Fairfax, Virginia. One out, nobody on. Boy, they're here from everywhere to be on hand for the Cubs kill. Line foul outside first. Val, Emma, and Deji Duggins from South Whitley, Indiana, and from Silver Lake, Indiana, the Clark family are here. And look at that, Yosh, 50 years with the Cubs. Finally with a winner. 1945, he was in service and he missed it. And now look at him, sitting on his laurels. In 1945, Jack, you were in Chicago, but you weren't with him. I could open the door during those Sox games and listen up the street and hear the Cubs winning the pennant, Harry. <laughs> he swings and he misses striking out. What a 
goes down swinging. Who did the Cubs that year that you went to the White Sox? God left this old Burt Wilson. Oh, I see. It didn't take you long to see the error of your ways, did it? <laughs> Well, I had worked several years at Cub games before that, but WGN Radio at that time gave up baseball. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, so that's why Burt stayed with the Cubs. Maybe I should ask you, who in the world was the dumb manager of that station in those days? <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a long story there. I won't bore you with it right now. Here's the pitch. He tried to bunt his way on McWilliams in, and he's in the hole 0-2. Two. two out. Nobody on. They're here from Michigan City, Indiana. Joe Shin and a group. Well, I'm going to mention every one of these groups. Here's a pitch low and outside. No matter how long. Anybody that could go and drive as many miles as they had to drive, an eight-hour drive, to get here when they realized yesterday that they had a chance to clinch it tonight deserves to have their name mentioned. Here's a pitch grounded right back to Sutcliffe. He's got it. Over to first. Nine in a row. Retired by the Red Baron. 18 left, Harry. Yeah, nothing across. Milo will be joining Jack and Steve here in a moment. I'm going to head over to the radio for a while. Harry Carey from Green River Stadium at the end of three. The Cubs are leading three to nothing. What? Look at this. This AT&T bill is outrageous. So change your long-distance service. Uh, uh, a penny for your thoughts, Lenny? Save your money, Baxter. Get MCI. And dial extra numbers? No. With MCI Advantage dialing, you and your employees dial like AT&T while saving big bucks hmm. on long-distance calls. My word. So get MCI Advantage dialing. First, I'll give AT&T a piece of my mind. Don't be too generous. <laughs> Call MCI now. We go to the fourth inning, and so far, so good. Six innings left to see if you can nail it down. Milo Hamilton joining Steve Stone here, and nice to be back in the booth with the old pal Jack Brickhouse. Let's and I tell you, the way Flipcliff's going, he might not even give up a hit, let alone a run. What do you think? Oh, He's really thrilling. got good you're, stuff, hasn't he? You're thrilling him tonight in Fairfield, Iowa, aren't you? <laughs> I don't care about that. I just want this club to win. I hope I've got a few years left to handle that. <laughs> Larry McWilliams has fallen behind in this game as he faces Sutcliffe. Oh, a good leaping stab of a line drive by Jimmy Morrison. I don't think Sutcliffe realized he hit that ball fair. He just stood in the batter's box and Morrison pulled that one down. He gets jammed with a fastball. There you can see him. He's still in the batter's box. Nice play by Morrison, who's made a couple of errors. Now watch Sutcliffe on this. He turns around. There he goes. Yeah, I think he thought it was going to slice and be a foul, and Morrison wouldn't catch it, but Jimmy really made a nice effort. Uh-oh. Bobby Denier tonight has bounced a short twice, once for an out to begin the game, and then a double play in the second inning. Wanted all of you young hitters to see how Dernier moved on that pitch. His first move was away from the pitch. Bouncer short. He ought to try somebody else. Lotus has gotten him all three times. Two up and two down here as the Cubs bat in the fourth inning. I can't imagine anybody joining us late for one reason or another, but it is a possibility. I'd love to think that everybody here is every instant. But in the first inning, Matthews drove in Sandberg one to nothing. Second inning, Sutcliffe drove in Boa two to nothing. Third inning, Sandberg scored on an error three to nothing. McWilliams working and strike call to Rhino, who's had two doubles here tonight, scored twice. I'd like to see him get a triple here tonight. Looks like he's headed for that 200 hits now. It's 194. To have the privilege of being the first big leaguer ever. Can you imagine the territory that encompasses when you say the first big league player ever? to get 20 doubles, triples, homers, stolen bases, and 200 hits. Fantastic, Milo. Incidentally, I'd like to see him get that triple for another reason. He stole home against this ball club last year one day, remember? That's right. This is a good park for him to get that triple into. This is a triple park. 
One ball, two strikes. Nobody on, two away. Good cut, and he fouls it up. Milo, the park before at 2 Forbes Field, as you recall, was a great triples park, too, wasn't it? That was a field that if a guy could play the outfield like a Clemente, he could play it like a violin, and he did. One of the big thrills in that park, he'd disappear in that right field bullpen, and here'd come the ball, and the guy'd be out at second. Bouncer, third baseman, Morrison, throws, and he got him. And McWilliams, who had staggered in the first three, has a 1, 2, 3, 4. So we're in the middle of the fourth inning. The Cubs trying to nail it down tonight are leading three to nothing. We go to the fourth inning for the Pittsburgh Pirates who are nine up and nine down to Sutcliffe. And the Philadelphia Phillies who were down to the Mets at one time four to one have tied them four to four. And they just flashed it on the big board here, and a predominantly Cub fan reacts to that. Well, why not get it from both ends? Win it yourself and let the Mets drop one, and then you know it's over. Nobody can ask for a recount. Well, I think to a man, they want to win this one and forget what the Mets are doing. You're right. And they won't have to look at that board the rest of this season. This is Joe Orselec. Bouncer. Bounce under the glove of Durham. Boy, he's going to try for two. the dirt it flattens out Leon would have had this ball but you'll see what happens right here hits the dirt just flattens out and speeds up a little bit under his glove and then Keith Moreland has all kinds of problems in the corner he smashes against the fence or goes for three his first triple of the year yeah, he, you know, they could have uh, scored that as a double because he stopped. There was no doubt about it. They have given it a three-base hit, however. And the pitch to Lacey. A oh, strike. Boy, he burnt off the corner on him that time with a good breaking ball. Sutcliffe has had a good off-speed pitch here tonight on two or three occasions. Used it for a strikeout a couple of times and got McWilliams to bounce back to him with another one. That one missed, and it's a ball. One and one to Lacey, who was called out on strikes in the first inning. Lee Lacey has had a fine year for himself after really not knowing where he was going to play or how often or what outfield. One ball, one strike. Got that corner again. One ball and two strikes. That triple, by the way, gave young Joe Ursulak a seven-game hitting streak. Sutcliffe can take advantage of the wide corners by keeping one away from Lacey right here. If he throws it just off the plate, he's got a good chance of striking him out. One and two. Fouled and way out of play up to the right side. You've talked about it before, I know, but Wire is consistently a pitcher's umpire, isn't he? he certainly has the wide plate, and he's shown it again here tonight. Ask Jody. <laughs> Got looking a couple times. He thought they were inside. One ball, two strikes. Ooh, he really thundered up on one, but it sailed on him, and it's two and two. After the game, of course, if this keeps up, you'll join in the festivities in the Chicago Cubs clubhouse. Yosh Kiwana says 39 years is long enough for me to wait for this. Two balls, two strikes. Oh, the just missed. He wanted that outside corner call and didn't get it. The toughest part about that clubhouse celebration is they always have two different types of champagne. And I hope they don't drink the sprayable and spray the drinkable because they usually save the good stuff for afterward, after all the exuberance. All right, let's see what he does with a 3-2. Arsalak at third, nobody out. Payoff. time that Lacey has struck out and strikeout number four recorded 
for Sutcliffe. Let's look at this strikeout. It's not a strike, but Lacey with a three and two count gets a little less selective than he normally would be. It's a good breaking ball. And this is a difficult man to strike out coming up now. Lee Lacey is a free swinger, but Johnny Ray just tries to make contact. The infield is back all the way around, conceding the run, except if it's hit at Ron Say. All right, there's your infield. Shortstop, second baseman back. High inside of all. Ray is another one of their hitters who is tough with men on. It's because he doesn't overswing. He just tries to make contact and hit the ball where it's pitched. He always has a very low total of strikeouts every season. Fouled way down the left side and just coming off of a week where he was the National League Player of the Week. see that your good suit isn't ruined in that locker. Pretty hard to ruin blue jeans, isn't it? I don't think anybody wore any good stuff today. 1-1. One, one. Hit him on the fist. Bouncer to second. The run will score. Sandberg will throw out Ray. Or select scores. And the Pirates get on the board. That's a pitch that not many hitters would be able to fight off. He hits it right off the thumbs. He's able to make contact, however, and that's his 64th RBI. Sandberg makes the play easily, but the Pirates cut the lead to 3-1. to one. Well, I'll tell you what a job he's done on the Cubs. That's his 15th run batted in against the Cubs. He's averaging an RBI a game against Chicago pitching. So it's a three to one ball game Chicago two away and Jason Thompson the batter Sutcliffe working with a two run lead now bounced it up there no harm you were here for a lot of years Milo newspapers are strange in this town I was reading a sport page today I saw an ad right next to the sport page for Ted McWilliams it's like seeing one for Walt McDisney <laughs> <laughs> well as long as they sent their check that's a strike. Jason's not having a particularly good year for him, but he is hitting the Cubs pretty well. 3-10 coming in. And the Pirates have hit the Cubs pitching well, especially Johnny Ray and Tony Pena. And uh, that's a ball. You know, Thompson went on a home run jag in that one series against us, and five of his home runs are against the Cubs. And he can take you to any field. Hits a lot of left center field home runs. Just a bit outside, and it is three and one to Jason Thompson. Many people here in Pittsburgh feel that Jason Thompson is going to be on the block this winter. They're going to use him along with the pitcher to bring back a power hitting outfielder or first baseman. Three one to Thompson. Foul back out of play. Three and two. Let's see if he can come back and get him. A lot of Cub fans here. A lot of them drove all night to come over. I can tell you one thing, the, if, if we stretched it a little saying that the Cub fans outnumbered the Cardinal fans in St. Louis, you're not exaggerating if you say tonight that the Cub fans are outnumbering the Pirate fans in this crowd. Three balls, two strikes. Sutcliffe working with a two-run lead as he tries to become a 20-game winner. That'll do it on a foul tip. Two strikeouts in the inning strikeouts in the game for Sutcliffe. The Pirates make a dent. One run, one hit. No errors, nobody left. We played four innings. Sutcliffe and the Cubs trying to do it tonight. They lead three to one. Ah, there's the Rainbow Man who did a fabulous job yesterday. I tell you, the job he's done and been nurtured along by Jim Fry and Billy Connors had his best year and he pitched a great game yesterday. I had dinner with him last night and I said that was the biggest game of your life and he said well I'm not so sure. I said name one bigger. I haven't heard from him yet. <laughs> one ball no strikes to Matthews. One and one. John Denny just walked in a run and the Mets have gone back in front of the Phillies five to four in the middle innings. High foul out of play to the right. 
Jack, do you want to refresh the fans' memory on the day that you and I uh, did 19 innings here today and I did most of it? Oh, we were talking about that before the game, Steve. It was really something. One it ball right, and two strikes. It was right in front of the All-Star game a few years ago. And the only two guys in the whole field that were going to go to the All-Star game were Parker of uh, Pittsburgh and Suter with the Chicago Cubs. So we got the brainstorm, put him on the 10th inning. So I went down to the 8th inning. He'd be ready for him after the game. And 10 innings later, Milo was still up here doing a ball game. <laughs> And I was sitting down there in that photographer's area waiting for this crazy game to get over. Finally went 19 innings before we finally got out of there. And I'm going to tell you something. That was some marathon. Yes, it was. Oh, he walked him again. So Sarge can start on his second hundred with that one. It's truly amazing that he's been able to show that much patience. I saw him as a kid coming up in the San Francisco Giant farm system, and he swung at everything. Then all of a sudden, as the years go by, it becomes more selective. 100 walks is quite an achievement. Well, the message board is the Pirates welcome the Chicago Cub fans here tonight. And the Cub fans respond. Well, I tell you, if I was drawing what they're drawing here and had the attendance swelled by the Cub fans here tonight, I'd salute them too. I'd insist that someone clinch a pennant here every year. <laughs> Marland, one for two, and a base hit in the third inning. Runner going, fouled up to the right. The run and hit was on. Moreland tried to protect him, went after a pitch that was up and in, and the Sarge will retrace his steps. Von Hayes is circling the bases. He's hit a home run, and the Phillies have tied the Mets five to five. Would have gotten you that sooner, but he wasn't a second base yet. <laughs> I'm not even at the game, but I'd have to take Denny out and put in a reliever. Five runs already. Go to the pen. They took Terrell out in Gorman's first relief pitch. Von Hayes jacked it. One ball, two strikes. Wonder if Arnie ever thought of doing play-by-play. -play. He's giving it right to us. He's in... Uh, direct contact with the ball game there. Any guy that could do all those glove trotter games could handle it. Handle the PA. He was also the dribbler. One ball, two strikes. That is through the right side for a base hit. Runners first and second. So Moreland, who had a four for four in the first game yesterday, gets his second hit of this game. And we got to start capitalizing with these innings with all this traffic and put some more on the board. The Cubs have eight hits. They've only got three runs, and they want to take McWilliams out of this one right now if they can. Pittsburgh doesn't have anybody up in their bullpen now. Matthews could not advance because that ball was hit very close to him. He had to wait to let the ball go through. So all he could get was second base. Here's the Penguin one for two. The key to McWilliams surviving as long as he has was when he got Say and Davis striking out in the third with two men in scoring position. Now the Pirate bullpen is busy. There's Jim Wynn one more time. That's the third time he's been up tonight. Yeah, he's pitched a ball game in the pen. Matthews second, Moreland first. A walk and a single putting them on. There's nobody out. Lined into left. That will drop. The bases will be loaded. Now, that was a jug handle line drive. Sarge couldn't come hard all the way for fear the left fielder Lacey would come on and catch it. Zimmer almost threw his arm out trying to hold him up there. There's no sense getting doubled off. Matthews, a good base runner, realizes he's going to make third base. And there you see the Sarge. The base is loaded. Nobody out. Jody Davis comes to bat. And this is the inning when they could go a long way toward drinking that champagne. Jody has been up twice and looked at strike three called each time. This is the spot to change that pattern. A cub on every base. There's nobody out. A fly ball could get you a run. A base hit could get you a couple. Swing and a tap foul left side. Strike one to Jody. Durham due up next. One thing about that infield that Chuck Tanner has in there tonight, they really don't execute all that well. The Cubs have taken advantage of it thus far. The Pirates have made three errors. So don't look for any defensive heroics tonight. 
No balls and a strike. Jody with a chance to bust it loose. Bouncer second. That's a double play ball. They turn it, and while they do, Matthews crosses with another cub run. 463 on the twin kill. This one is Taylor made. Jody tries to take the fastball the other way. And Wotus comes across. Makes a nice throw. No way in the world for Ron Say to get any piece of Ron Wotus. Four to one. The Cubs have their three run lead back. I guess you can say he was in the Wotus position. <laughs> no, you could say it. I've been waiting all night for that. You had it away longer. And huh? you were going to get it in. <laughs> Bouncer first. And McWilliams has dodged another bullet, giving up only one run. Oh, he's been in trouble every inning but one. One run, two hits and a walk. No errors and a man left. We have played into the middle of this one as the Cub bench. They're not as relaxed as they look, folks. But they are in front, four to one. to the bottom of the fifth inning. Sutcliffe is out there again with a three-run lead in a four-to-one game. He'll be looking at Tony Pena, Jim Morrison, and Doug Froble. Doug Jones from Batavia, Linda Davis from Joliet, part of the group coming over to see the Cubs. Tony Pena popped up to Durham in the second inning. The Cubs... Chuck Tanner looks on. Five years ago, his club won it all. And it seems like day before yesterday, he was a Cub. Actually, it was 57 and 58. Yeah, it was almost yesterday. Everything is relative. <laughs> and there's the skipper trying to win another pennant. He did it with Kansas City. Wouldn't it be something if Kansas City won it and the Cubs won it and they met? a strike. Well, the fellow who helped get the record together for Keith Moreland and Jody and the guys that they are selling and raising money for charity. Paulie Gallus, our old pal, and his wife Jeannie celebrating a 24th wedding anniversary as they watch tonight. Paul Gallus? Yeah, you know Paulie. Whoa, the beach ball? Sure. <laughs> Whoa. Huh? Uh, you remember Jack, Paul. You remember... <laughs> yeah, Paulie Gallus. So he helped the guys get it together. I hope it does well, because some charity is going to end up with some nice donations. That could go up the middle, but Boa's going to get it. Boa throws, and he got him. And Pena pulled up lane. Looks like he might have pulled a hamstring. He got out of the box badly, and about halfway down, he just pulled up. So what looked like it was going to be a very difficult play for Larry Boa turns into an easy one. And now the only thing left is concern over Tony Pena. What a big loss that would be. Let's watch it one more time. Pena still hasn't gotten back to the dugout. Well, if it's going to happen, this is the time for it to happen to him because they're not going anywhere and he's got all winter to get well. If that had happened to him in April or May and he'd pop that baby as aggressive as he is, he'd be a tough guy to make sit down with a hamstring. But you've just got to do. There's no cure for it except rest, is there? Once you tear it, if you try to come back too early, you're looking at six weeks to two months. Well, that's a real tough injuries in the game. And that's an injury that a trainer wants to look you right in the eye, and you better tell him how it is. He doesn't want any, I'm going to get it out. He, he wants that hamstring to really heal before he lets you back in there. Well, you remember Leon Durham last year was out for five or six days, thought it was just a twinge. First time he ran, he pulled it again. That's a foul. I have not been down close enough, I'm sure you have, being on the mound or either being a base runner, even in a dugout. I've heard guys say when they really tear it, it sounds like a gun going off. Two balls and a strike. That's a ball. You can hear it both that and the Achilles tendon. You hear a pop. And after that, there's not much left. Well, you've talked about the two that they fear the most. Well, 
Achilles tendon is automatic surgery, and the hamstring is just a, a lot of time off and a long healing process. But that's one of the things that the Cubs have really been able to avoid. They go on extensive stretching programs, not only in spring training, but all during the course of the season. And they've had relatively few leg problems this year. Three balls and a strike to Morrison. Fouled it off, three and two. Mets are batting in the fifth inning. Score tied with the Phillies, five to five. Here, the Cubs are leading four to one. Sutcliffe trying to put another notch in his belt, not only to win 20, but try to win that Cy Young. Milo Hamilton with Steve Stone and Jack Brickhouse along with us tonight up in the TV booth on WGN Television 9 in Chicago, Chicago's very own and America's number one sports station. And if the Cubs hang on tonight, the news will follow a long celebration on Channel 9. So the news crew don't get ready yet. A let up. Right to the Penguin. Two away. Took something off to get Morrison. Got a note here that says, say hello to the Corey family. Steve, Mel, and Seth. Says something about being the diet kings of Scottsdale. Well, then they know the spot to go, don't they? <laughs> Stevens, of course. Another small portion joke, huh? Do you think that uh, Jack Brickhouse will join us tomorrow noon for lunch at Polize? I think it's great of uh, Larry to volunteer a about, clinching how about celebration. tonight, fellas, after the celebration? Because he won't be open. <laughs> Plus, it's Monday, and he's closed on Monday. That's no excuse. <laughs> We're in town, and the Cubs are winning. Arnie says we ought to go over to his house. A ball and a strike. Sutcliffe working with two away and nobody on. Froebel was called out on strikes in the third inning. One of five strikeouts recorded by Sutcliffe, who hasn't walked anybody, has given up just one hit, has led since the opening inning, and right now, that big right-hander is leading four to one. Good breaking ball. He fouled it off. Sutcliffe, as far off as he was the other day when he pitched against this club, he's right back in his groove tonight. He throws a high fastball on the outer portion of Doug Froebel. He'll strike him out right here. Doesn't even have to throw it over the plate. Two and two with two down. And it's a full count. The Brants from Kankakee are on their honeymoon. They were in the Poconos. They said, if we're this close, let's go see our Cubbies. Got enough of it to foul it off and stay alive. John Candelaria wants to say hello to the Terescos back in Chicago. Oh, the Candyman, the reliever of the Cub of the Pirates now. Relieved again yesterday, got another save. He said he's thrown four days in a row, and he doesn't know how long he can do it, but he said he'd love to do it in the bullpen for the Cubs next year. He says teamed up with Lee Smith. That would be an unbeatable combination. Oh, my goodness. A comebacker in the big, tall right-hander was able to handle it. Three up and three down. Shorter wouldn't have gotten it. We have played through five, and that big guy right there who has turned this club around is trying to get the big win. The Cubs are leading four to one. And they've gone to a new catcher, and I figured they would. I just knew they wouldn't take a chance on letting Pena go back out there, and it's Milt May. This time of year, when you're out of it, you don't want to take a chance with any of your players. That's why Marvell Wynn is not in there tonight. That's why Dale Bear is not in there. And now Tony Pena joins the ranks of the injured, so Milt May has come on, and he wanted to get the signal straight with McWilliams. Just foul down the third baseline. You know, Milt's dad, Pinky May, <laughs> one time in the minors, he homered against his dad from another ball club, and his dad ordered him knocked down. <laughs> uh, I bet his dad's watching tonight. One ball, one strike. McWilliams fouled up by Boa. Boa had a hit in the second inning, got to second on a throwing error by Morrison, and scored on a Sutcliffe single. 
Right now, the Cubs are in front four to one. They've out hit the Pirates nine to one. Hey, look at the good doc. Dr. Glue, Tony Garofalo. Don't get hurt, Tony. That's back under the wicket. Shortstop will not have a play. Bo is on for the second time. That is a base hit. Once it got by Mick Williams, Larry Boa realized he had a good shot at a base hit. If Mick Williams doesn't stop it, it's through the middle. And as it was, Wotus can't come over and make any play out of it. Here is Sutcliffe. He drove in a run in the second. And a ball that just picked up speed. And Ray, moving to his right, just got a fingertip. And that was all. And it went on into center for an RBI single. Bunting this time misses strike one. As much as Jim Fry would like to see him swing away, he's got to be butting him. You want to get Bo to second base? The Cubs have nine base hits and three walks. Ten, excuse me, and they've only been able to put four runs up on the board. And Fry knows the value of another one, so watch Sutcliffe bunting, and he would like Jason Thompson to field it. Sutcliffe ready. Not this time, working on Boa, and the little captain was only about a half a step away. Boa in the last six weeks doing a lot of things. Not a big batting average, but some key hits. And been hustling down that line, been playing good shortstop. He'd love to have another ring, wouldn't he? One of the things that Jim Fry said when he went with Larry Boa down the stretch was, I know he's going to make all the plays, and I need a dependable man out there, and Larry filled the bill. 0-2. Oh It. Pitcher's got to come off. His only play is to turn around and throw it away, covering it first. That's a 1-4 shot. So the big right-hander did just what Fry sent him up there to do. One thing I disliked about the play by Larry McWilliams was he had all kinds of time, and we've seen it time and time again. When a man comes in and bare hands a ball that you don't have to bare hand, you just leave yourself open for a mistake. If you have some time, use that glove. I think the carpet lulls them into a sense of false security because when you see a club come off of that, for instance, come to Wrigley Field and play on the grass, they try that and it usually costs them. Runner at second. Denier looking for his first hit of the night. If he could deliver here, it would be a big one. Drives it down the left side, but it will hook foul and end up in the bullpen. The word on Tony Pena. To look. The word on Tony Pena pulled groin muscle. All right, that's why they got him out of there. You knew the way he pulled up that it wasn't just a, a need for a little Alka-Seltzer. He really had a, he had a pull. And Takalvi getting loose in the bullpen, so they're going to go to the eighth short reliever early. One ball, one strike. I guess with all the money they put in the game, I should have said roll aids, huh? Out into right center. It'll hang up a long time. Center fielder Arcelik makes the play. Boa tagging, and he'll run over to third. Two away, it's up to Sandberg. That wasn't a long fly ball, but it was good base running on the part of Larry Boa. That's heads up baseball. There's a lot more ways to score from third base than there is from second. I don't see enough of that, boys. Too many cases with one out, and that man on second on a fly ball, the guy doesn't tag up and go to third. And you can score so many ways from third base with two out. All right, we've got Sandberg with two doubles and a bounce out. One ball and no strikes. Cubs batting in the sixth. They're leading four to one. They've led since the opening inning. Oh, he almost threw that away. And there was one of the ways that you can get that run from third. If he hits a wild pitch. Nice play by Milt May, who's not known for his agility. Milt's always swung a pretty good bat. Two balls, no strikes. Moves it up to 3-0. and oh. Matthews would be next. Ryan Sandberg with a seven-game hitting streak counting his hits tonight. Three and one. Larry Boa led off the inning with a single. Sacrifice got him to second. Fly ball to center moved him over to third. There's a fly ball out into center. Arcelik will be there. And he 
Kearney makes the play, almost misjudged that ball, but stayed with it, made the play. So a leadoff single is wasted by the Cubs. Bow is left at third. Go to the bottom of the sixth inning. Cubs in front, four to one. Pirates will bat here in the bottom of the sixth. Wotus is due to lead it off. Then they'll go to their bench with Mitchell Page. Jack Brickhouse just brought up a good point, Milo. He said, what's in a pitcher's mind right now? And I said, he breaks down the game into a 27-piece puzzle, and those are the 27 outs. You take it one at a time. If you're successful with each piece of the puzzle, you throw a good ball game. And Sutcliffe isn't thinking about anything right now except Ron Wotus. If he gets him, then it'll be Mitchell Page. If he strings together 27 outs, he's got himself the 20 game, the championship, and most probably the Cy Young Award, but that'll all come at the end. This is Walters, who struck out in a foul tip the first time up, and it's a ball. End of six innings at Shea, tied 5-5, Phillies in the Mets. Here, Sutcliffe, as he works, has a 4-1 to one lead. Bottom of the sixth. High fly ball right, hangs up a long time, Moreland over, lots of room, lots of time, makes the play. So Otis flies out, and Mitchell Page will be announced as the pinch hitter. To this point, Sutcliffe has only given up one hit, and that one could have been fielded except for a tricky hop by Leon Durham. So Rick Sutcliffe has gone out there with a positive attitude tonight. He hasn't been happy with the type of stuff he's had in the last two ball games, and he realized that he'd have to come up with a good one here. Jim Fry brought him back a day earlier than he was scheduled. That was because if a tragedy happened, he would be available for Sunday. Doesn't look like that's going to happen if Sutcliffe continues along the same lines today. Mitchell Page started as a pirate, went in a big deal to Oakland, had a couple of pretty good years for them. Now here he is back. After he got to Oakland and had a couple of good years, he found himself back at Tacoma part of two seasons. So Jim Fry and Billy Connors on his left, Don Zimmer on his right. First year as a Cub skipper, trying to put them in the winner's circle. Foul back. Two strikes. Last night in the hotel restaurant, Dallas Green was having dinner with his wife, Sylvia, and they called Billy Connors over. He said, come on, I'll buy you dinner. The way you've been getting thrown out lately, you must owe the league a fortune. I can pick this one up. Nobody on and one away. Bob Beck, who was the subject of a big... Oh, Sparky Anderson's old nameplate. Well, that's kind of nice because he won his 100th game, the only manager to ever do it in both leagues. Beck uh, from the uh, Wild Bunch over here, and Carol Haddon, a season ticket holder for many years, part of the contingency who said, we've got to go see him do it on the road. One ball, two strikes. He got him. And that is number six in the strikeout department for Rick Sutcliffe. There's always two ways to get Mitchell Page. You could get him very high or very low. Sutcliffe chose the low road, and that curveball out of the strike zone retired Page. Up to the top of their order now with Joe Orsalak, who had a base hit in the fourth. It turned out to be a triple. Yeah, had Davy Lopes in case he would be called on stretching out in the clubhouse. <laughs> the first base side and it'll be clean because once it got by the mound nobody's going to get him. They have two hits and the rookie Arsalek has them both. Good idea by Joe Arsalek. Gets the ball by Sutcliffe. No chance. Everyone who talked about Arsalek before the game said he's really an aggressive player who hustles all the time. He's got a great arm. Reminds you of Clemente or Dave Parker. Only question mark, is he going to be able to hit Major League pitcher? Well, one thing that bunt does, it takes anybody off the hook about the other one that uh, was a little tainted, so nobody can talk about that now. Lee Lacey has been up twice, struck out twice. He's batting with a runner at first and two away.
Rookie mistakes and only nine more outs for Rick Sutcliffe. He has him leaning towards second. After that, it's easy. See you later. The inning's over. Picked him off, and we have played six innings, and the Cub fans are starting to celebrate already. They want to do it in their seventh inning stretch. The Chicago Cubs, four. The Pittsburgh Pirates, one. Steve Stone and Jack Brickhouse, Harry Carey, back at Three River Stadium. We go to the top of the seventh. The Cubs are about to clinch their first championship since 1945. And moving in to tell you about it here in the seventh inning is the guy who missed it in 1945, but is here for the big victory in 1984, Jack Brickhouse. All right, Harry and Steve, thank you very much. Just uh, kind of fun here to do one for old time's sake, and the Sarge is up there. He did me a big favor the other day at St. Louis when he popped one out of the ballpark and gave me a chance to give it the old hey, hey. Score of the ball game, of course, the Cubs out in front by a score of 4-1 to one right now. And Tacaldi is the new pitcher. And the Sarge has had himself a perfect night so far. A single and two walks. One run batted in. One scored. Cubs out in front. They put a lot of men on base tonight. They have ten base hits and three walks. They actually haven't capitalized as much as they could. And Tacaldi has just thrown one past the Sarge for a strikeout. Tacovi is 3 and 9 with a 287 earned run average making a 69th appearance that leads the Pirates. 13 saves also leads the Pirates. 81 and 2 thirds innings, 85 hits. He throws from the side. He's very difficult for right-handers to hit. And he's put together a pretty good year this year. All right, Lacey, Orsalak, and Froble in left center and right. Morrison, Wotus, Ray, Thompson, the infield third to first for the Pirates. Tacovi and Milkney, the battery. And there's a strike. Coaching at first, Vukovic over at third. Don Zimmer played umpire wire with Montague, Rennert, and Greg at first, second, and third. So we're just a few outs away, as the man says, from that great moment. And believe me, these Cub fans up here are making a lot of noise. There's a good flag down by Thompson. Makes the unassisted put out at first base on Moreland for out number two. Credit him with a fine play on that one. Jim Fry went to Chuck Tanner when Fry was the manager of the Kansas City Royals, and he said, I've got a young right-hander. That throw is very similar to Tacalvi, and I'd like Kent to work with him. Can I have your permission for Tacalvi to work with Quisenberry? Chuck said, yes, you can, and Tacalvi really helped Dan Quisenberry become the dominant reliever in the American League. Jack, uh, Jeff Winkle, who's the liaison to Governor Robert Orr of Indiana, has just called in a, a uh, message here wanting to congratulate the Cubs on a fine season. We'll be watching them in the playoffs. Ball one. Ron Say the batter. Two for three. Singles in the first and the fifth sandwich in between them a strikeout in the third inning. Ball one strike one. You know, fellas, as I sit here, watch this game tonight and and just, you know, pray for this big win. I can't help but have some great memories flood back. And I'm talking about memories between the Cubs and the Pirates now. The history of this of this rivalry is just absolutely uh, ripe with all kinds of great moments in sport. I suppose the most important was that darkness homer of Gabby Hartnitz in 1938. We'll never forget that one, of course. Did you call that game? Did you, were you doing no, it again? No, I was in Peoria in those days. I was working baseball, though, Steve. I was working three I-League ball then. Ball two, strike one. There's a ground ball to the right of the mouse. Slow roller picked up by Johnny Ray. The throw is in time, and it's a one, two, three inning for Jacoby. No runs, no hits, no errors, nobody left. All right, on your feet, everybody. If you're a Pirate fan, and if you're a Cub fan, sit down. The score of the ball game, Cubs four, Pirates one. All right, here's the ball game going now to the Pirate half of number seven. Cubs out in front, four to one. I'm Jack Rickhouse, along with Harry Carey and Steve Stone and Milo, and we're having fun at Three Rivers, I'll tell you. And Jack, there was a sign that said, Welcome back, Jack, and it said the fans from New Zealand. Now, when did you do baseball? New Zealand. Oh, that's New Zealand, Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> 
It was really from Peoria, but they didn't know how to spell Peoria. <laughs> the sign didn't play in Peoria, Jack. <laughs> Lee Lacey leading off, number two man of the batting order. Shuttle is still in there doing a fantastic job. So we're talking about those great memories, Harry and Steve. The last Cub triple play was against these Pirates last year. You fellas ought to remember that one. Say to Sandberg to Buckner last year. I remember the last triple play I saw also was against these same Pirates. Manny Sanguian hit into it at a ball game I worked right up here in 72. Ball one. Cub outfield straight away, fairly deep. Foul ball. Gary Matthews in left. Wait a minute, have we got a change out there in left? Is that Cotto out there, fellas? In the seven, they're tied up 5-5 in New York. Foul ball, Dernier in center, Moreland in right, Say, Boa, Sandberg, Durham, the familiar infield, third to first, Sutcliffe, and Jody Davis, the battery. There you go. <laughs> Look at that, and there's the Budweiser right. ready, too. Ball two, strike one. There's a foul ball down the third base side. You know, the very first no-hitter I ever saw was against these Pirates. Sam Jones threw it in 55 at Wrigley Field. He filled the bases in the ninth inning with walks, and then he struck out the next three. Right, right, struck out the side. If Hollywood writes one like that, they say the writer got carried away, huh? Ball two, strike two. Al Monchak coaching at first. Bob Skinner at third. That's a strike call. Knee high to the outside corner. And Lacey was really fooled by that pitch. No complaints on that one. Lee Lacey started walking back when the ball hit Jody Davis's glove. And Sutcliffe strikes out number six. He's only allowed two base runners, but it was one man twice. Orselak, who tripled in the fourth and beat out a bunt in the sixth. That's all that's kept him from absolute perfection. Now let's take a look at Johnny Ray. Right back to the pitcher. That takes care of that one. Sutcliffe has done that three times today, so the glove has helped him out. Hey, he's, he now really wants to Cy Young. Uh, he wants he wants a gold glove. Get your hands off the cigar, Jack. <laughs> Don't you dare light one up. Who, me? Yeah. If I grab that cigar, it's to throw it out of here. <laughs> Well, we have something in common. Oh Jason Thompson. A rose between two non-smoking thorns. There's a ground ball dribbling down to say a third. Going to be a little close. He is out at first. A one, two, three inning. All right. No runs, no hits, no errors. Nobody left. Six more outs to go with the score. You better hold it now. I held it for you guys. You hold it for us. Jack. The Cubs four, the Pirates one. <laughs> Harry Carey back at Three Rivers Stadium. We're going to the top of the eighth. There you see the first world champions insignia. Cubs, 1984. Six outs to go, and the Cubs will have clinched the Eastern Division Championship and will be making plans for the playoffs at Wrigley Field Tuesday and Wednesday, October the 2nd and 3rd. Each day, the game will start at 1.25 Chicago time. Jody Davis leading it off. There's a ground ball, deep short. Up with the ball, Wolter fires the first of the out. Don't go away now. Even more exciting than the victory here will be the celebration in the Cubs clubhouse. And WGN Channel 9 is well prepared to bring it all to you. The cameras are already placed. Arnie will be there with his crew. One out, here's the bull. There's a high hopper. They get him at first race. 
It looks like the Cubs are anxious now to get this uh, thing over with to get to the clubhouse. You know, when that Jacoby uh, turns sideways, he's almost invisible. <laughs> he is the original. You know, he may there. have put on a couple of ounces since he came up, and it, it shows. <laughs> I remember he told us one time his eight-year-old kid beat him arm wrestling. Yeah, but he's gained a little weight since those days. He's, he's gained about 20 pounds over last year. Some think that maybe that's why he's not as effective. Here's Boa. He's had two hits. Hey, the Sarge is out of the ball game. Is in the clubhouse of Jay Johnstone. You knew he wouldn't miss this celebration. <laughs> Happy man, the Sarge, and why not? What a year. There's a little pop fly in the infield. One, two, three. Let's get him out, get it over with. Countdown time, six outs. We're going to the bottom of the eighth. Cubs are leading four to one. Back at Three Rivers Stadium, everything else an anti-climax now. Uh, Henry Cotto is playing left field. Sutcliffe is uh, there. That tells it all. The magic number is oh, 0 The Cubs, there's Jim Fry. He looks the same today as he did opening day, but you know he's a far happier man. I think he's got a heavier cadence to the gum chewing. It's a little bit more brisk tonight as they count down with only six outs left. Six, here's Milt May to lead it off. So many notes. I've been reading them as fast as I can. I want to recognize all these wonderful people. Little reason. And Jake and Helen Devine from Valparaiso are here. This time I read to you the governor's mentioned wire from the state of Indiana. Governor Orr. Here's the pitch to man to strike this call. Alan Carlin is here from Morgantown. West Virginia, formerly of Lincolnwood. There you're getting a look. You know, WGN has set up not only for complete coverage in the clubhouse of the Cubs, but we have three different points of pickup in Chicago. The, the Sports Ultimate Bar, Wrigley feel where it's crazy time already, they tell me. All the bars, Murphy's and Cubby Bear and Bernie's and all that crowd. And Rush Street. The, the mayor won't be there tonight, boys and girls, but go ahead and have fun. I'll try to compensate here in Pittsburgh. You're going to pick up all the tabs, Harry? Oh, why not? Always do anyway. <laughs> one and two the count. I said that one time, and a guy wanted to hit me for it. $11,000. Here's the pitch to me. Well, Harry, there have been people who want to hit you for a lot less. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, I, I know one guy I'm going to hit if his cigar doesn't improve in caliber. Now, I gave you an inning of dispensation because I got to get on downstairs. Two balls, two strikes. Line drive right to down for the out. That's been the only ball. Sutcliffe. And it isn't one of the two hits. The two hits, the first one that resulted in a run, here we're going to show it to you again, a line drive, was a dribbling ground ball that just got by Durham and trickled into the corner, rolled around the two walls down there and went for a triple. The second hit was by the same man, Joe Orselak, who beat out a perfect drag bunt. There's only been two fly balls with seven strikeouts. That shows you how dominant Sutcliffe has been all night. Here now is a strike on the outside corner to Jim Morrison. Chris Dresson and George Gieselman from Burbank, Illinois, came over to see the clincher. There's a pitch foul off. There's a note from some friends of yours, but I can't find it. Jim Russell and Bill Dale are here. There's a high pop foul out of play. 
Tom Bowman from Valparaiso. Jim Dowdle Jr., Rick Collins, John Scanlon came over from John Carroll University to celebrate. Chuck Tanner. He knows what it's like on the, on, the on the other side is right. 1979, among other championships for Chuck Tanner. It's been an exciting run for him here in Pittsburgh. You know, Chuck's feeling for Chicago being what it is, I know that if he couldn't win it, there's no team he'd rather see win it than the Cubs. Oh, and to the count, Sutcliffe really in the breeze. His 14th in a row, his record 16 and 1, 12 and 0 since the All Star break. He st struck him out, strike out number eight. And we got four outs to go. your teetotaler ice something up i don't care what it is even if it's plain water and then pour it over your husband's head or something but look at johnstone drinking coffee who's he kidding he wants to make sure he stays awake for the celebration <laughs> two men are on nobody on trouble the hitter the Groovers are here from Arlington Heights. I am the Sarge. You yeah. certainly have been the last couple of months. The guys are here from Jocko's in Madison, Wisconsin. Strike call on the outside corner. Here, I think these are your friends, uh, Arnie. Bory, Mick, Mickey, Jane, and Kay. From Lafayette, Indiana. Here's a pitch swung and miss. These fans, I, they haven't announced the attendance, but I'll bet you all, but maybe a hundred, have come from the Chicago area. A little looping pop fly, Boa's got it. Three outs to go. Well, here we are taking you this far. Now I gotta leave you to get down to see a celebration in the locker room. Enjoy some for me. I'll join you as soon as I can. At the end of eight innings, we're about to become champion Cubs four and the Pirates one. Listen to the hand for Rick Sutcliffe. They're rolling out the champagne in the clubhouse. There you see some of the Channel 9 equipment, the strike call. For Colby on the hill. <laughs> it looks like the, uh, the expensive kind. You know the story on it, don't you? Oh. Tony Garoppolo's dad is in the wine business. He got it at cost. <laughs> I was going to say, it sure doesn't look like that cheap stuff that you get at Steve's restaurant in Scottsdale. What else? Yeah, that's the expensive. Listen to hand for Sutcliffe. He's tipping his cap. The Red Baron has pitched a masterpiece. One out. The Weingarts are here from Chicago. One out. The Lanigans are here from Laporte, Indiana. The Hendricks are here from Chicago. The Johannes of Chicago. The Feldman of Northbrook. They're neighbors of Scott Sanderson, whom you saw in the clubhouse a moment ago. One out there near the batter. The Campus Sigma House of Northwestern celebrating the Cub Championship. In case you even care, the Mets are still tied with the Phillies. Here's where the story is. The Cubs are winning with three outs to go. The Giesemans from Burbank are here. Now, 
have some friends of yours, I think, Arnie. There's a ground ball hit to Sharp. Easy play at first base. They're from uh, Gary Stein. Does that name mean anything? A columnist for Fort Lauderdale News. MVP, listen to him. As Ryan Sandberg comes up. They're yelling MVP. He's retired nine in a row. So we've gone to the bottom of the ninth. Hold everything, including that champagne. Cubs are leading four to one. Harry Carey back in Pittsburgh. It's about to happen. A message from Eddie Munzel. Former sports writer, a great gentleman, congratulating the Cubs. Barney Foshi of Mississippi, congratulations. Judge Captain of Yankton, South Dakota, congratulations. Howard Wolfen and Rick Ruggo, out of Governor Jim Thompson's office. Mayor Gann of Streamwood, Illinois. Wotus, the short stops the hitter. There you see the Cub dugout. Three outs away from the first championship since 1945. That was a war year. to appreciate how much of this crowd is from, is from Chicago. There's Steve ready in the dressing room. <laughs> Lee Mazzilli, the pinch hitter. One out, only two to go. Sutcliffe about to nail it down for the Cubs. Look at the totals on the board for the Pirates. One run, two hits, three errors. Lee Mazzilli, the hitter. Fouls it out of play, two balls and a strike. Joel 
Sarek, who has both hits. A dribbling trip on the right. They just roll around in the corner against the wall. And a safe bunt. That's how close Sutcliffe has been to perfection. This guy's the only base runner. And he was on twice. Was picked off once. He will have faced only 28 men. 27 would be perfection. He started the swing and held up. Hey, on the appeal, he went around, they say. There they come into the clubhouse. There's Bob Iback, our Doug publicity man, Yosh Kawada in front of them. They're on their way in. There's Vince Lloyd, who's handling the clubhouse for the WGN radio. Here's the ball. in Chicago sports history. Rick the Sutcliffe, the 20th win of the of year. What a night here. The people are going crazy. Harry is just unbelievable down here. A happy bunch of Cubs, a well-deserved win. It's great to be in the locker room. I'll tell you what, this is something they've been waiting since spring training for. Nobody thought they could do it. As it turned out, they did. So Rick Sutcliffe, the man of the hour, Harry. You're going to be back to me in a little bit, so take it away and explain the game to everybody who is going crazy in Chicago. I think much of the, just as much drama is on this field. These great Cub fans, there's Rick Sutcliffe. The Red Baron indeed. What a ball game he fit. The expressions, there's what made them a team. Genuine affection for each other. And Jody, Woo! this is what you've been waiting your whole career I'll for. i tell you what, this is, so yeah! <laughs> this is so great, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's been, it's been a while now coming, but I tell you what, uh, there's nothing any better. What was it like to catch Sutcliffe tonight, a two-hitter, probably as good a stuff as he had in a while? Well, yeah, he's, he had his good stuff. Um, I haven't caught him that he hadn't had his good stuff. Uh, maybe he didn't have quite the pop on his fastball, but he changed speeds, and his location was so good that um, you know, it really didn't matter. This is great. Is it work all, all the work in spring training to be here tonight? Oh man, all the work, the whole year of the spring training, the off season, everything makes it worthwhile right now. Weren't you the one who said, "What did the Mets do?" Yeah, <laughs> what did the Mets do tonight? <laughs> it doesn't matter what the Mets did tonight or any other night because that's it. Chicago's been waiting a long time for this. Jody, it's just been a magnificent time, and everybody came together tonight. When you came into this ball game, what were you thinking about? Well, we knew we just, you know, we were right there. We we're one away, and um, with Rick going, we knew if we could if we could get him some runs early, then it'd just make us a lot, a lot easier on us. And uh, you know, to put um, to put one up in the first three innings, and to give him give him a three-run lead right there off the bat, um, we knew right then that um, you know it was going to be close. All right. 
right, look who I've got here, a half-drowned fella who's the happiest half-drowned man in the world. Dallas, congratulations. I know what this means to you. Well, Brick, it, it's it's neat to see all these guys enjoy it. It's, it's neat to have our fans enjoy it. I know it's neat to have you enjoy it, by golly. You, you know, that, that was great that you had a little share of it, and I'm uh, proud of you. We waited a long time for this one, Dallas. We all, we all have waited a long time. Our Cub fans have waited a long when, time. When did you feel like you had really turned this club around? I really felt after we came out of spring training, we made the Matthews the near thing. We came out of spring training, we we played pretty good on the coast and came home and played good. I felt then that the team had enough stuff to get it done. But we had a breakdown. Sanderson Ruthman broke down. We had to go out and make some trades. We got that done. Our baseball people worked hard all year. This baseball team is a good baseball team, Jack Brickhouse. No you know that. about that. There's no for Dallas. I know you got nine million yeah. people to say hello to, so go right ahead. But you do have Keith Moreland. He's been through this before. And what's the difference between 1980 and this year for you, Red? Well, first of all, Cindy, I told you we'd do it. <laughs> uh, I think it, the thing that's different in 1980, I, I was going to establish winning baseball team, and, and uh, I came to this team. I was the first transition that Dallas made. I, I came here in 1982. Uh, we didn't play too well for a couple years, and you didn't know what was going to happen. And then this year, I wasn't sure I was going to get a chance to play. And now, just to get the opportunity to be on a ball club that's division champion, I thank the good Lord for that opportunity and, and love every one of these guys in this room. It's it's nothing you can describe, Steve. It's like, uh, you know, losing is like kissing your sister, I think, you know. And, and uh, this is this is just the greatest feel you can have in the world. we got two more of these parties I hope to go through. Uh, I've been through this before, and uh, let's just celebrate tonight and try to take on the Padres. It's got to be vindication for you because it was a tough two months of the season. I remember talking to you then. It was frustrating for you. All of a sudden, everything came together and does it make all the work pay off well anytime you get like I said uh, uh, you know you got to feel fortunate anytime you get the opportunity to play in the big leagues and then to get the opportunity to play on a team that's a contender and then get a chance to win like this and like I said uh, uh, I at that time I wanted to go play baseball if I'd have known now what I know now I wouldn't have said a word but it ended up just like I couldn't have read it down on a piece of paper and made it any better well Keith congratulations Thank you. Jack Brickhouse is with Ryan Sandberg take it away Jack all right Ryanie boy here's the guy that they're really crowding around here. It's the one you can breathe in here, Ryan. What a feeling this has to be for a young guy like you. Unbelievable. This is what it's all about, is winning. And, uh, you know, this is what we've been shooting for all year. And it just, it just seemed like it took a long time to get here. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a great feeling now that, it, uh, now that everything's happened all right for us. What were your thoughts in that ninth inning? Anything at all? Like, please hit it to me. I was ready for the ball hit, just like any other time. And, uh, you know, I was just waiting for that last out. You know, just feel like a volcano out there, ready to burst in that, that situation. At any time this year, did you really feel you were going to have the kind of a season you're winding up with? Not really. I, I kind of surprised myself this year a little bit, but... Uh, you know, I had some success, and uh, then I got my confidence built up, and uh, after you that, hear I was all, expecting Did you hear all those Cub fans yelling, MVP, MVP, yeah. the last time you came out? I heard out? that. I heard that. It's a great I, feeling. I, a lot of Cub fans around here. All right, all right. Congratulations. All right, Stevie, who have you got over there, buddy? Bobby Dernier, and a happy Bob Dernier. It's the first time around for you. You were there in September with the Phillies, but nothing like all season of contribution, Bobby. No, I'm proud of everybody in here, and uh, this is it. This is the best. Thanks, Vicki. Becky. KC, and thanks to everybody in here. This is great. These these guys are, uh, I'll go to war with them tomorrow. This is the best. Is this stuff good for your hair? I don't know. Everybody's got it all over I them. I don't care. I got the worst moss in here, so I don't care. This isn't the only place that's going crazy. They're going crazy at Wrigley Field. We've got a camera there, and we're going to show it all to you. continue to go crazy here. They're going crazy at Wrigley Field, but that's not all. We take you to the ultimate sports bar and grill where there's a big celebration going on.
looked all over for Harry Carey, and it's a shame that he's not here because right now we're going to the place that he loves the most, Rush Street. because he keeps putting it in my eyes. As well as someone else here. Leon, how does it feel? Hey, Steve, it feels great right now, you know, to come over here and accomplish something that a lot of the ball players really set out to do this year. And ever since the first week, the last week of spring training, we were able to get together as a team. And the way Dallas had went out and, and picked up Suck Cliffs and guys like George Frazier has to come over here and did an outstanding job for us. So we got a lot to be thankful for now. Is it a little better for you now after a real tough beginning of the season? Some boos, not many but now it's got to be a vindication for everything you did this year. Yes, well, it was the purpose of uh, the situation with Buckner and I at first base, and, you know, the fans, they, it, wasn't, it wasn't the, the purpose of me being booed. It was the situation, and, you know, I, I took it well, and, you know, I was just glad that I was able to get out there and perform and, and play the position the way I knew how and, and got to continue playing it this year. Leon, your ace went to the mound tonight. Did it give you guys a little feeling of comfort to know that the big guy was out there hurling for you? Yes, but when you got a guy like Sutcliffe out there throwing, and, and he's good for maybe one bad out, but you can't see this guy going to go out here and have back-to-back -back bad outings. The last one he had in Chicago, he was due for that one. So this uh, this uh, appearance he had tonight was outstanding for us, and it kept us relaxed after we got out and, and got the, uh, the the go-ahead lead, and it didn't bother us. We were able to just put things together. I'm just glad we go ahead on and just go to the playoffs right now. Leon, congratulations. Right, you Steve. earned it. All right, thank you. Jack Brickhouse is with the skipper, Jim Fry. All right, I got him right here. Congratulations, Jimmy. That was some embrace you and Dallas gave each other, and I can certainly understand it. Well, I tell you, a lot of people don't realize the things that are said and done, and 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 I appreciate the nerve that Dallas showed. And nobody in baseball works harder, and he, and he went out and did some things this year that took some nerve, and I, I appreciate it because he gave us some great players, Jack. We'll be back with more on that special day following this message. Well, I guess you fellows will never stop celebrating that particular moment, would you? <laughs> what do you think, Zonk? Well, I think it was a time in my career, or, or individually, that uh, I'd never had a group of, of men that I'd have been associated with that I was as close to as I was the 1984 Cubs. And uh, I'm looking forward to the fact that everybody is pretty well intact that's coming back in 1985. You know, uh, Rick, uh, it seemed like it took just a uh, part of a second for you to realize that the, you had won the division on that last pitch. <laughs> you didn't react right away. It was kind of embarrassing, really, because if, if you stop and think about what happened to me last year, the first three months I spent in last place, and it was just kind of embarrassing. It was like I wanted to go around and thank everybody because there were so many people that played such an important part. It was, it was really a team victory. Steve, uh, you went through this uh, scene of jubilation with the Orioles, right? I just think that things were a little bit different for the Cubs last year, Harry, because with Baltimore, we felt that we could win it most every year. The Cubs hadn't won it in so long, and when this group of players came together in spring training and you looked around and you said, okay, if they are going to win it, where's the talent going to come from? Well, the man on your left is one of the reasons why they got there. And there was a lot of fill-ins during the course of the year. <coughs> Dallas made some great trades. The team pulled together. And I think probably around July, the ball club really felt like this was going to be their year. And they went out there every day and proved to the New York Mets and everybody in the division that the best team in the National League East was the Chicago Cubs. I would say that the two men to my left uh, uh, really <laughs> were responsible. Uh, you know, you could go right through your lineup, it seems to me, and uh, make a case for each individual in that position to be named the most valuable player of the ball club. Really because did. at one time or another during the course of the season, every single one sort of carried the ball club himself. I remember this guy here about the first four out of the first five games that I pitched got the game-winning hit. Then he went through that week where he had a home run every day to win the game, it seemed like. And, 
You know, the, the, the little things were, to me, the, the big difference in what happened last year. I've seen things in Chicago that never happened in Cleveland or in Los Angeles when I was there. We, we knew just about what to expect from each ball club before the game even started. And, you know, they talk about great defensive outfielders and shortstops and what have you. Well, you know, to me, I would rather have a guy like Keith that knows where to play and catches anything that's hit to him than a guy who might have all the speed in the world and might break the wrong way to begin with and then run like the devil to get there. Now, the guy that runs real fast wins the gold gloves, but these are the guys that win the ball games for you. You know, I think it's an interesting point. Uh, everybody contributed something, and that's why it's a little earlier. It truly was a team victory. Well, I think any time that you go out and win baseball games, it, it, it takes a team to win it, uh, all the way down from the owner of the ball club through the broadcast booth, through the people that, that put the game on that made us America's team, so what? During the year, you can't think as players what the fans did for us in Chicago. Uh, uh, I've been through world championships in Philadelphia, same as Steve said in Baltimore, where you were expected to win and they had great fans, but I don't think there was a situation in my baseball career any time through college and and now in professional ball that were other people other than just the players had influence on the players. Most of the time it's the players that lead, but I think the fans are led too. Now it's 1985. 1984 is already history. 1985. The question is, what have you done for me lately, they're going to say, right? <laughs> Do you think your fellows are better and should win easier this year than last? I don't think it, it's going to be easier. It, it really wasn't easier last year, or easy last year, getting no. to where we got. Um, there's a lot of things that uh, are going to come along that you won't expect this year, but um, I think we're going to be a better ball club because we've, we, we've grown together. We, we yeah. started playing better once everyone gelled, like Steve said, in July, and, and I look for us to, just to keep going from there. It would be nice to get off to a good start, but I don't think it's going to be that important to this ball club because we feel like we can win. When, when I came over here, I had some doubts. I mean, I, I'd, I'd lost for two and a half years. I knew what it was like to go out there and lose, but this ball club didn't know that, and they didn't expect that, and because of that, they didn't do it. Yeah. I don't think uh, Rick was around two years earlier, was he? <laughs> <laughs> he? He might have felt like he was in Cleveland had he been. Yeah. <laughs> well, they take the wins away. When spring training starts, you guys will have no wins, and all those moment, all the momentum that you had from last season is gone. When you start spring training, you get everybody together. Do you rededicate yourself to? eliminating the fact that you, you had a great year but you finished one game a little too soon before everybody really wanted to finish. Yeah. I mean, what will be the attitude of the ball club going into spring training 1985? Well, I think any time that you uh, lose, there's got to be something taken away from you. I mean, we lost something as, as a group of individuals because we really felt like we were the best team in baseball and we didn't get to that point. We failed in what we're looking for, but I think that was one of the keys to, to why I'm so happy about being a Chicago Cub is the fact that, that the makeup of last year's club is intact yeah. and there's a lot of them that are getting to the end of their career and the older guys like Larry, Ron, say, and guys like that are getting to the end of their career where they would like to go out with one more world championship. You know, they both won one. And then you have the guys like Ryan and, and, and Jody and Leon, who are the, you know, like the backbone young players of the club with phenomenal stardom. Where, you know, you can't say enough about all three of them. They're phenomenal players. But they haven't had that, that chance to get there. And uh, I think the makeup of our club is going to be a hungry one. I know I'm hungry. I'm ready to go win. I, I'd, I'd love to play Detroit right now. Let's go try again. You just want to stop shoveling snow <laughs> yeah, and get down to spring training. <laughs> hey, Rick, how are you going to have a better year? How can you be better than 16-1? I could win one more ball game, for starters. That would, uh, that would top it all. You know, I know that gnawed at you, didn't it? It has, and it, and it always will. But, uh, you know, that's, a, that's one of the things about baseball, that there's always that human element involved. And uh, on paper, we're a great ball club, but that's not going to win any ball games for us next year. And, uh, you know, we're going to need a lot of luck, too. We're gonna, there's, we've got some key people we can't afford to lose. And uh, if we do lose them for a little while, we just hope that the guy comes in and fills in. And as Keith said, the competition, I think, is what's going to make us yeah. better. We got Davey Lopes, who's coming to come to spring training. He's going to push some people. Sure. He wants them playing time. Uh, he can help us in a lot of ways. We got the left-hander in Fontenot, and we got all of our starters back. Uh, we're probably only going to use four starters the first part of the year, and we got eight guys that, that want those four positions. So we should have a good starting rotation. Who do you think uh, has improved themselves the most during the course of the winter? Which team in your division? 
I think Pittsburgh. Yeah. I really do. I, I think they have a good starting rotation, and I think they've got some pop now with the bats. Uh, you know, everybody talks about the Mets and the acquisition of Carter. Well, they scored runs last year, and they had a good lineup last year, but to me, the question mark is, has been and will be their pitching. Yeah. Uh, they lost a guy, Terrell, who I thought was as tough on us as any of the pitchers that they had, and, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of people. You, you look at what happened last year, and they had the Mets and the Cubs picked last in, in yeah. every prediction that ever came out, and, uh, you know, here we come into this year, we'll probably be picked at the top, but... Who knows? Hopefully it won't flip-flop. Hopefully yeah. we'll be right back there again. Zonk, who do you think uh, helped themselves the most? Well, I think uh, Rick's absolutely right. Uh, the acquisition of Carter is going to help the Mets make them a better club because of the kind of player that Gary is. But uh, you, how can you say that a team didn't improve themselves when they add two hitters like Steve Kemp and George Hendricks and don't lose, basically, the pitchers that made the Pittsburgh staff is as good as any staff in the National League. I mean, I don't face the Chicago Cubs staff, so I can't rate them as far as, as pitching staffs, but I would put the, the Pirates staff last year as good as any in our league that we face. On any given day, they can throw a guy out there that can beat you. They were tough and, on us last year in Pittsburgh. And they played us well last year, and then you throw in the, the uh, Steve Kemp and the George Hendricks, because I think George Hendricks is one of the best hitters in our league. They haven't hurt themselves at shortstop either. Uh, they got Foley, haven't they? Yeah, Tim's going to play. I, I, Could he play every day? I don't know if he can play every day, but if if uh, they can get somebody to do a decent job when he can't play every day, I mean, in a sense, and play once a week uh, to rest him, maybe in a sense of what Larry does this year, uh, shortstop, uh, uh, I would say that... Uh, they're going to be a tough ball club. He to just beat. gives them that guy that can catch the ball in the eighth and ninth innings, and that's when the errors can kill yeah. you. You know, yeah. early in the game and early in the season, you can get by uh, with a few mistakes at that position. But you get into the latter part of the game or the latter part of a ball game, you got to have somebody there that can throw somebody out. You think that's going to be Larry's uh, job? coming in in the late, in late innings of ball games? Or That's a tough situation. Yeah. <laughs> I, I talked with, uh, you know, Jim Fry about that earlier, and he said that, you know, it was going to be a toss-up right now. They were going to go get I'm kind of pulling for Boa because if he makes uh, the club and starts every day, I might get to hit eight. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't believe you said that. Larry, that wasn't me. Uh, I think that uh, uh, I agree the same as he does. I, I, if, if there's anybody besides Sandberg on our ball club, that I would say that if we get to the seventh game in the World Series this year against somebody and there's two outs and a man on third, I want the ball hit to Larry Boy. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, you can't get any better than he was defensively last no. year. So, and he, you know, everybody so has you can't, tough you, years. You know, that's play. not my job. My job is to try to play right field as best yeah. I can. Well, you, you have enough hitting. You proved it last year. Whether Bowie hits or not, he's still valuable to your ball club. He does the little things. He, he moves <laughs> people over, and, and, you know, he has hit the ball in the past, and there's no reason to believe that he might not come back and, and have a good year offensively for us. Do you feel a little bit about the, uh, the situation of a youngster like Sean Dunstan? You know, first of all, to try to replace Larry Boa is going to be a tough job, and he knows it. You know that the attention of the media has got to be on this kid from the very uh, uh, number one day of spring training. Uh, it seems unfair to have to go through all that, yet all of you fellows have to do it. You do live in a, uh, in a goldfish bowl, as it were. Uh, what advice would you give him if, you, if it was your job to advise him? going into spring training 1985 with everybody looking to you to be the shortstop. Go work my rear end off. <laughs> I would go out there thinking that uh, if, if I get this job, it's because I worked hard enough to win this job and did the job. I wouldn't go out there thinking anybody's going to give me anything because uh, I've played long enough now and I've had years where I thought I played pretty well and came back the next year and lost a job in spring training. Recently, <laughs> that happened recently. <laughs> can you make so, the pressure uh, work for you? Because there's going to be a lot of pressure. Yeah, I think on you can. I, Steve, I think you're absolutely right. I think that you can go out there and say, "Look, uh, they're they're forcing me to do something that I'm uh, uh, that I better do. They're on the job. If I don't do it, I'm not going to get it." And I think that that's the way I'd be doing it if I was in the management end of, of what we do. And uh, so I'd be going out there thinking that I, I've got to do it. I put it in myself and I'm doing do or not situation. If I don't do it, I don't deserve it. If I do it, I think I deserve it. How about you, Rick? What, uh, 
What advice would you give the young man? Well, for one thing, I've heard that he's a lot like the, the guy we had in, in Cleveland, Julio Franco. They say that he's got a lot of offensive tools. He's got a good throwing arm, but arm. Uh, has a tough time sometimes making the routine play. Uh, you know, that, that's a tough situation, and, and I'm glad I don't have to make that decision, but uh, probably early in the year, if the guy has a real good spring, he might get a chance to play. But I think you'll see Larry in, in, in the majority of the ball games, and, and definitely towards the end of each ball game. A moment of uh, nostalgia, 1984. We saw the Victoria scene, of course, but for you personally, what was uh, the most exciting moment of the year? Most exciting moment was... Uh, just first of all, besides getting traded over here and, and <laughs> picking up 29 games in one night, the most exciting part for me was just uh, finally feeling accepted. You know, just I don't care who you are and what you do. When you come over here, it, it's tough to, and really it, it kind of happened off the field. Uh, the first couple of weeks I was with the club, Keith and, and Jody Davis and Rhino started calling me and inviting me to do things and inviting you over during, you know, it was tough for my family to come over here and just to be accepted so soon just made it so much easier for me and and that was really the exciting part because my wife one night and I we looked at each other and we said you know this is fun I mean it we couldn't believe that it happened so soon I saw you in a few places in town where you were having dinner with your wife and when you got up to leave people <laughs> let you know that they recognized you and and cheered you as a matter of fact well, it would... It, How to make you feel great. <laughs> it sure did. You know, it, it's just kind of a, a snowballing type deal. I think everybody got involved in it last year. And I know that the fans and the players and, and the front office and my family, I know everybody had a lot of fun. And, and I think everybody's looking forward to having even more fun this year. How much, how much did that have to do with your decision to come back? Because that was obviously one of the big stories of the winter. You read it in the paper every day. All of a sudden, you did sign with the Chicago Cubs. Because I had a contract out on him. That, uh, <laughs> he didn't sign back here. He got shot. Keith, how about you? Was it a home run in the clutch or a great a defensive play in right field? What was your most memorable moment of 1984? Well, I think that's easy for me to answer in the sense that uh, it happened in Pittsburgh on one night when we clinched it. And the only person that may know it is maybe Bobby DeNier because he was right beside me. I couldn't run in. And, and jump in the crowd. All the thing I could think of was I just put my hands in there and I said, I cannot believe this because when I got traded here, I felt like cutting my wrist. I'd just come from a, <laughs> a world championship team and a team was in the playoffs and I, I, I've always been around winning and I love to win, but I like to enjoy the people I work with too. And then uh, after I've got here and got used to the city and everything, I, I like the city and I love playing for the Cubs and I wouldn't want to play anywhere else at this point in my career, but I just put my hands in the air and I, I I tell you, I won a world championship once, and uh, I don't know if it was any bigger than it was just to see the fact that I was here through this whole thing in Chicago when we had uh, a man that I respect in Lee Ilya that uh, came in and started the whole thing, and just the whole progress all the way through Jim, Dallas's job, the transition that brought uh, Rick here and, and everybody, just the whole thing has came a long way. Harry, you've been here, yeah. and many of the fans know it, but that was just a big point in my life. I think that that was just a great thrill to think, hey, I've been here through this whole thing. We got a date a year from now talking about the first world's championship for the Cubs in many, many years. Our thanks to Keith Moreland and to Rick Sutcliffe, stars of the Chicago Cubs. We'll be back now with sports writers Fred Mitchell of the Tribune and Joe Goddard of the Sun-Times right after this. Primarily, we want to talk about the Cubs in 1985. But first, let's find out with our uh, pundits of the press. Fred Mitchell of the Tribune and Joe Goddard of the Sun-Times, how they evaluated the Cubs last year, 1984. How'd you pick them? Thank you very much. <laughs> I picked them last. Uh, I just looked over all everybody's picks uh, during the winter, and uh, I was the only one to put them last. But what did I know? I was with the White Sox at the time. <laughs> but, you know, Dallas Green has not forgotten that, and I don't think he's forgiven me. <laughs> Fred, how about you? Uh, this time last year, I picked the Cubs uh, fourth, as a fourth-place team, and, and I feel still that at that point uh, that the Cubs were a fourth-place team. They did not have Gary Matthews and Bob Denier and Rick Sutcliffe and, and so on and so forth, so I felt that they were a fourth-place team at this time last year. Steve, you think these fellows are expert enough? For us to discuss the 1985 <laughs> Cubs after that mediocre uh, estimation of a year ago? Well, I think with a six and a four, they can't do too much worse if they evaluate <laughs> the Cubs this year, Harry. But I believe coming off of last season, 
and realizing what the Cubs did to help themselves and Dallas Green's commitment to winning, I got to believe the picks are going to be a little bit different in 1985. Well, let's start right from the top. What are they in 1985, Joe Goddard? Do you have you have much to atone for? <laughs> this is this should be easy now. <laughs> uh, but I want to go along with what Fred just said. All the pieces are now together. Last yeah. year, he had Dallas had to keep bringing them in, and it was a big jigsaw puzzle, and it all came together at the end. Now his picture is just about complete, and the only problem area is at shortstop with Sean Dunstan. Can he make it or can he? Um, I have to go with them again, even though. Carter has been added, Gary Carter's been added to the New York Mets. How about you, Fred? I, I still like the Cubs, and I think if we were guilty of, of anything uh, uh, in terms of underestimation, I think we underestimated Dallas Green and his ability to fill the gaps. And I think that the few holes that the Cubs have now can be filled by Dallas uh, in spring training through trades. Steve, uh, when we talk about uh, the coming season, 1985, we talk about the Cubs, and I know many people are going to pick them. I think that thing we sometimes overlook is not how much better your own team is, but how much improved is your competition. Well, last year you look at the division, Harry, and nobody really helped themselves. Everybody just kind of stayed with what they had, but that's not the case this year. Pittsburgh becomes a contender suddenly. They've added a couple of hitters. They look like they're going to be strong. George Hendrick and Steve Kemp certainly have to help them in what was a woeful offense last year. And I believe that the Mets with Gary Carter have really helped themselves, but the Mets have a little bit suspect left side because now there's no security but blanket for Ray Knight. He's got to play third base every day. Nobody behind him like Hubie Brooks, who was traded to Montreal in the offseason. So Philadelphia has some question marks, but I think that all the way across the board, the division's going to be a little bit tougher, so yeah. it's going to be tougher for the Cubs to repeat. Who do you think, Joe, uh, has helped themselves the most in the National League, either division? Well, certainly not the Cardinals. They didn't do a thing, did they? No. Oh, I can't believe that. Um, they weaken themselves, I think, because uh, David Green is still... Uh, a terrific prospect. And LaPointe is a good left-handed yeah. pitcher, and they got a man who's coming off severe knee surgery and Jack Clark. Who knows how that's going to hold up on the St. Louis AstroTurf. So I think St. Louis has hurt themselves a little bit in the winter. Losing Suter automatically takes them out of it, I think. Um, I look for Philadelphia to, get, to make it a little more interesting this year because um, they, they did what other teams did not do in the last few years, and I'm thinking primarily the Milwaukee Brewers. They didn't build, they yeah. just stayed with their people, and, uh, and they went from first to last in two years. Uh, they have introduced younger players, and now, now those younger players like Von Hayes, and uh, you're going to see a new shortstop this year in Steve Jeltz. I think they're going to stay in the picture a little longer this year. Fred, how about you?